Allegedly. Thank you. And you're in the middle. In the middle. No, actually, they asked me to put Steve in the middle. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, That's yes, what yes, I said. Yes. Okay. yes. Right. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome. So I have a bit of a cold. My voice is a little uh, gravelly. I apologize. But you guys are in for a wonderful concert tonight. I'd like to introduce to you uh, Mr. Stephen Goss, who is the composer of the centerpiece uh, for tonight, the uh, concerto, the guitar concerto inspired by Isaac Albaniv. Good evening. And of course, our music director and conductor of our Oregon Symphony, Carlos Calmar. Good evening. Hi. Now, um, Steve, this piece, you know, this concerto, you wrote about nine years ago, right? I did. I wrote it in 2009, in mm -hmm. fact. Yeah. What were the circumstances surrounding it? Well, um, there's a guitarist called Xu Fei Yang, a very fine virtuoso from China. Yes. And she was working with EMI on a recording of the Rodrigo guitar concerto, yeah. the very famous guitar concerto. And I'd done a few projects with EMI and with Xu Fei before. Mm -hmm. And they said, look, we're playing, doing this concerto with the Barcelona Symphony Orchestra. It'd be really great to have some Albanith on the album. You know, would you like to arrange some Albanith for guitar and orchestra? And then I got talking to Xu Fei and talking to the producer. And then after a few conversations, I thought, wouldn't it be great if there was a big romantic concerto for guitar based on the music of Albanith? It would be so wonderful. I mean, Albanith is this amazing Spanish composer who wrote mostly piano music, but many other things too but never a note of guitar music, although now his music is most known in arrangements for guitar. Um, so I just thought it'd be quite fun to have this imagined concerto for guitar in this, this wonderful late romantic style. And it's kind of I mean, paradoxical that we know him best today because of these arrangements um, that he would recognize as his own, of course, but very different than, than the original works that, that he wrote. Yes, I mean, the concerto is based on piano music. It's all, uh, and a lot of it is from Iberia, which is a piece he wrote quite late in his life, has highly virtuosic piano stuff. So I've just taken the melodies from these late pieces and orchestrated them in the style that he used for orchestration, but also drawing on composers like Debussy. So it's got this sort of rich Spanish French color. How did you choose which piano pieces? There are an awful lot of them. Yeah, that was the thing that took the longest time because you also had to find pieces that would fit together in a concerto. Mm -hmm. And in this concerto between the third and fourth movements, there's a long cadenza, about four minutes. And in it, you hear all the themes being mixed together and, and, and changed around. And there was one theme in the third movement which sounded very similar to a theme I used for the piece in the fourth movement. So I was just trying to find things that sounded similar that could be convincing as a single concerto. Well, I've read also that your intention was to make this almost an integrated concerto where the movements aren't uh, more standalone, but they're kind of flow from, yeah. from one movement into the other as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I sort of organized the, the scheme of all the different keys very carefully. Uh, and it takes you on a sort of, um, I suppose, an emotional and uh, uh, journey through sort of the full range of, of what Albany did in his piano music. Yeah. Now, I was reading your biography, and I saw that uh, you began your music journey, musical journey, playing guitar yeah. uh, when you were eight years old, I believe. But That's then right. you also began playing violin and viola in yeah. orchestras. And so you're very familiar with both the, the guitar as a, as, a, as a solo instrument, but also the workings, the inner workings of what it's like to, to play in a symphony. Yes, I, I did. I played um, violin and viola till I was in my early 20s and played in, in many very good youth orchestras, so that gave me an insight. Um, and then I studied composition mostly, so obviously a lot of orchestration. And now, um, at the moment, I'm writing my 10th concerto. Oh, my goodness. They're not all for guitar, but... Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's become a thing, I don't know. We'll come back to the piece in a moment, mm. but um, Carlos uh, Pablo Sainz Villegas has, has played here before in Oregon, I think 2015, but you've also worked with him uh, elsewhere in Chicago most recently, is that correct? I worked with him in Chicago, I worked with him in Spain, I worked with him, I think it was in Houston. I mean, we are friends. <laughs> and it's, the thing with Pablo is uh, there is always this, uh, for me, uh, this absolute stunning humanitarian aspect in mm. his, actually it's how he is. He's a very kind human being. And in a way that translates uh, a little bit into his 
music making uh, because you have to understand uh, that uh, of course our first encounter is, and not the only one uh, was Rodrigo's famous concierto uh, de Aranjuez and um, when you are a guitarist and uh, you are being called to play a solo with orchestra trust me 85% of the time they will ask you for concierto de Aranjuez <laughs> 95 percent <laughs> yeah and and in a way for a guitarist you, you you it's not that you do that but when you are in performance number 775 of yeah. that you're like mm -hmm, well <laughs> and despite the qualities of the piece and pablo he might not be at 775 but he's way in, in the many hundreds and it struck me how serious he is when on stage and how much he kind of looks for different colors that I actually have not heard. And that is also to some extent being translated in the way he plays Stevens' piece mm. because I hear uh, there are some things that he does that actually make me smile just because, not, not because they are funny, but because they are to me, so enjoyable. And also there are little things uh, in terms of knowledge of Spanish music mm. in, the, in the last movement, where uh, all of a sudden um, this uh, Stephen's piece gets uh, in such a way that the orchestra again takes the absolute lead and all the guitarist does is chords. He plays <laughs> chords. And um, there is a kind of song underlying there, and the song is very from La Rioja, which produces, aside from uh, amazing wines, also great guitarists like Pablo Sainz Villegas. He's from there, and I ask him, so how do you do that? Do you do it with freedom, do it without freedom? And he immediately said, oh, this, is, uh, this has to be with kind of heartfelt freedom if you wish so. I mean, don't, what he was saying is, don't be so cold blooded, just <laughs> go. <laughs> and all in all, uh, just talking about the interest, one thing that is absolutely stunning in Stephen's piece is something that essentially normally wouldn't work. A guitar is a wonderful instrument, but very soft. Uh, so don't put it against a big orchestra because, <laughs> sorry, you're not going to hear it. Uh, but um, when we were rehearsing the first rehearsal and I was thinking about the string reductions that I was asking for, I said, we will reduce the strings, but not that much. I mean, I'm not going to make this piece a piece where there are six first violins and five seconds and everything is like, don't even play because you can't hear the guitar. It's very smartly kind of written so that you have on one side the soloist as the soloist and on the other side you have a rich palette of colors in an orchestra and sometimes we just go for it it's stunning we'll enjoy it i'm really excited about this um composers have been writing new works based on older works for hundreds and hundreds of years when you tackle a piece like this are you concerned with how you think he would have envisioned it himself? Or are you taking the pieces and, and obviously making them into something new and imbuing your style into it? I guess I'm asking how concerned are you with, with his intention, with what you think his intention might have been? Uh, that's a very good question. I mean, in, in this piece, the whole intention was to try and make it sound totally like Albanian mm. and not like me at all. So my intention was to, to have it sound so that someone coming in could say, oh, I didn't know Albania wrote a guitar concerto. Wow. That would be my ultimate aim in, in, with this particular piece. Yeah. But actually, it's interesting what Carlos was saying about the size of the orchestra, because this piece has been done uh, several times, but always with a smaller orchestra than this. And I was absolutely delighted in rehearsal to see this full section of strings. It was, uh, and then to have them play so beautifully softly to let the guitar come through, that's uh, something very special. 
Absolutely. Now, do we, I, I know that we are recording, by the way, tonight for a future broadcast, but I, you'd mentioned, obviously, the guitar is a very soft instrument. Um, is there any kind of, of uh, uh, do we push it uh, acoustically at all to try to make the guitar um, heard above the orchestra? Not really, because Pablo doesn't like that. Got it. Pablo, okay. Pablo once thinks, just let me play it and... Uh, you guys figure out how to do with how to deal with me. But essentially, <laughs> that's his position. And uh, since we have worked here uh, alone in Portland, this is, I think, the fourth time he's coming. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are talking about uh, probably the last six years only. That's a stunning run for a soloist. But we all love Pablo, and so the the orchestra is like. Here you have it. We get soft if we want, and we, we, it's like uh, we put a really wonderful carpet underneath him, but we go really bold when uh, the piece requires it. Okay. I mean, I think one thing that uh, Stephen can tell us, because yes, I know that you tried, uh, I think, very successfully to make a piece that sounds like Albanese, but is not by Albanese. Mm -hmm. So. Just to clarify, um, how much of this piece is Albanese? Uh, meaning you just took a piece and completely orchestrated and put a soloist, and how much is yours writing in the kind of as if? Well, each of the, <clears throat> each of the four main movements is based on one piano piece, but it doesn't follow the piano piece from the beginning to the end. I just use the material and turn it into a dialogue between guitar and orchestra. Mm. Some of it is reharmonized, reshaped. Um, but it's funny because I know I wrote the piece 10 years ago. Sure. And listening to it today, I couldn't really remember which was me and which was Albert. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, I don't know. Okay. So. Nice. Now this is the centerpiece of, of the program. It's in the second half. Uh, the first part of the program is this uh, storied work by Johannes Brahms. I say storied because Brahms's journey toward writing his first symphony is legendary. It took 20 some odd years because he was in the shadow, famously, of Beethoven. And before then, almost as a, an exercise, he wrote these two lovely standalone orchestral serenades, one of which we'll hear tonight. And actually the one that uh, you're going to hear tonight, Brahms, uh, upon kind of dialogue with his friend Josef Joachim, uh, considered cons uh, uh, naming it a symphony serenade. Mm. But f because essentially Joachim said, well, this actually is a symphony with a bit of additional movements, uh, because it has more movements than uh, a symphony. But essentially, this is, come on, <laughs> just name it a symphony, man. Uh, and Trump's uh, in the end said no. And that, I think that uh, what you are going to hear and the fact that it's called Serenade, and it's early Brahms, um, points very clearly also in the direction of how Brahms was presumably as a human being. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when you read about this piece, you read about a tiny, tiny city in the middle of Germany called Detmold, who has not really grown ever since the Brahms times. It's still 35,000 people living there. But it always has been a hub for culture. One of the most famous um, conservatories of music is still in Detmold, of all places, which is in the middle of kind of nowhere, uh, at least in German terms. Uh, and um, Brahms, with the help of Clara Schumann, who recommended he got a position there and was teaching piano, conducting a female chorus. And you learn that in the, those years he even had a very intense uh, love affair uh, with a lady that essentially, as people say, he couldn't commit. It was very serious, but he couldn't make up his mind. And so that, uh, because the Brahms was in a way sh very shy and somehow thin-skinned. And then two things happened. 
One was that he got to hear, which is very obvious, uh, Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 9, and that was like the giant Beethoven looking over his shoulder constantly and thinking, you are trying to write a symphony, huh? Yeah, try again. Uh, and the other was um, that uh, he was very, very close friends with Robert Schumann and Clara Schumann. And Robert Schumann did something to Brahms that is wonderful, but, and Brahms took it as it was, but it uh, kind of cast another shadow. Schumann said to everybody, when Brahms was barely over 20, this is the future. This man, barely over 20, is going to make history and music. He has, and he went on, and it's a very, it's a very poetic quote, and it speaks like, oh my God, the Brahms, the greatest, etc. And Brahms felt a little uncomfortable with being praised that much. And so, in his uh, death mold years, he wrote these two serenades, and he wrote uh, a bunch of pieces for <laughs> female chorus because that's what, that is what was available. And this serenade, I, I can tell you one thing, this serenade is, um, is as good as his symphonies, mm. just if you think of Brahms as a younger man, because the biggest difference, if I can explain it, is that this uh, serenade lacks a little bit the intricacies of the inner voices that later uh, define Brahms. Mm. He, Brahms is always a composer, regardless of whether it's a late symphony or an early piano piece or whatever, it's always a, a person, as a composer, who looks back at the tradition, the big tradition. And this is a piece that is written in the tradition of very late Mozart, early Beethoven, but it's vintage Brahms, mm -hmm. um, and it makes uh, an orchestra sound Brahmsian, but the floor is a little, the ice on which you walk as an artist is a little thinner, mm. because there is not this rich texture on which we rely. You're little, I, 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 talking to the musician, I said, well, the problem with this piece is it's brilliant music, but you are a little bit naked all the time. Mm. <laughs> so there are things that are, I give you one example of things that are interesting but strange. So first movement, that alone I can tell you about the ending of that movement is very, very odd. Second movement for everybody who is a specialist in Brahms will, the first two bars will remind you of the second piano concerto. Uh, the third movement, which is the most mature of this, is a rich, wonderful, typical Brahmsian adagio slow movement. And then comes two, two minuets, one after the other, and the minuets are in their orchestration are barely three instruments. That's all there is. Mm. Something that he went, would never have done later in life, but that's what there is. And then we have another scherzo and then the finale, and we end with big glory. It's a fin I always loved this serenade very mm. much. I, I think of these serenades as being somehow lighter and more lyrical than, than the symphonies. But I've been listening over the week to this first serenade again in preparation for this concert. And I, I, I guess what has, been, what has st struck me um, that hasn't in the past is the juxtaposition of how there are parts that are very um, uh, happy and upbeat, but also kind of melancholy. And he goes from this major to minor key several different times, and he just kind of swims between the two through the entire work. Well, that is, uh, I th in a way, that is typical Brahms. Mm -hmm. Brahms uh, is this, he wrote a song that actually is one of his, you know, art songs. and. Um, the lyrics, the first sentence of this uh, song uh, actually explains Brahms pretty well because it, uh, if I may translate it of the cuff, it says something like, or oh, would I know the path back to the happiness? And that is very Brahmsian, meaning he always looks at, oh, those were actually the good times, but they are 50 years, 100 years ago, <laughs> and I won't actually go there. And in this, the serenade, serenade actually tells you something about lighter music, but 
yeah, there is the light, so-called lighter first movement, for folk music-like, and then the second, the first of the two scherzos is actually very dark in the beginning and very hushed, and the third movement is all to you, and there are always these things that remind you of, oh, here is a very serious wo voice already saying something to us that later Unfortunately, only wrote four symphonies instead of one. Nine. Nine. <laughs> one final work on the program. Uh, we're staying in Spain with this work by Joaquin Torina, the Danzas Fantásticas, uh, written in, in Paris, but still with that incredible Spanish influence. And I understand also influenced by a literary work. Um, I'm not sure. In, in part, but uh, as, as spoken about music, yeah. I have to go back to Stevens' Please. concerto because Albéniz. So, in a very, in a nutshell, uh, Joaquín Turina was, uh, when he was a, a kid, showed tremendous talent. Essentially, he was designed to become a doctor. But he, he, he came from a family where artists existed a lot, and so he showed talent and they let him study. And uh, when he was, I think, in his early 20s or something, he went to Paris, which was at that time the center of music. And he befriended Manuel de Falla, the great Spanish composer, and they hung out together. And uh, there, was, there was a concert with music by them that was actually attended by Isaac Albeniz. And Albeniz took both younger colleagues for a drink. And Albeniz was the one who said to them, listen guys, what you wrote is very talented, but it sounds French. Remember <laughs> what we are. We are proud Spaniards. So go and rely on the folk music of Spain, that is what, uh, what actually we need to express as a country. Uh, there has to be something like nationalistic flavor, if you will. So Albeniz, again, influenced those two, and out of this came the Danzas uh, Fantásticas, which admittedly is a, it's a very Spanish piece. Yes but the orchestration is still French. <laughs> I mean, it's still this, this the, the, the thing that, the, I mean, the, the interesting point, and uh, I, you live in London? Yes. So the interesting point is, of course, I don't know how much Spanish music you guys hear in London, and when it, especially when it comes to orchestra. But here in the, in, in the United States, what do we hear? The suite from the three-cornered hat, the concierto de Aranjuez, the bolero, which unfortunately is by a French composer, <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end of it. I don't know, is it different in, in Britain? Uh, not particularly. I mean, you do get other things, uh, other pieces by Falia. Sometimes the harpsichord concerto is done. Um, Nobody does that here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but no, not a great deal. And of course, the, the most uh, well-known Spanish music is, as you say, by French composers. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 so the, the interesting thing is that the Danzas Fantásticas by Joaquín Turina is phenomenal music. It's really good. It's three movements. It's all in all maybe 16 and a half minutes of, of action. And um, one wonders what happened. Why is it? Maybe it's the name. Maybe we don't associate um, uh, Spaniards with, uh, let's say, serious composition. Because what what Turina does is actually he elevates the music of Spain, meaning of the country side, to something that is actually stunning. So you will hear in the first movement a jota. It's one of the famous dances. Uh, just done so well and what I what gets me every time uh, is the atmos how atmospheric the music is because it's not you think about okay flamenco vamos ole and it's not yeah that happens too but don't worry there is more stuff to it 
and uh, he takes in the second movement a dance from the Basque country that is in a very strange meter, 5-8, so it's 1-2-3, 1-2-1-2-3, 1-2-1-2-3, it's called a Tzortziko, and does something with that. And uh, the last movement, which is called Orgy, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a farruca, which is another Spanish dance. It's, uh, I mean, for an orgy, it's very organized. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it's, but it's brilliant because it, it kind of, so it gives you an outlook on what Spanish music in an orchestral setting can be how wonderful orchestration actually is done by uh, Joaquin Turina, and it also gives you the, the comfort of, okay, at the end, we all stand, I, I always admire those, uh, th those ladies and uh, gentlemen who are so slender and they have something like, their spinal cord is like, Bush, and <laughs> everything is character. That's the piece. <laughs> ending, ending the concert with an organized orgy. So we've got that tonight. <laughs> Carlos Kalmar and Stephen Goss, thank you so much thank for you. your time thank tonight. You. Thank you. The concert begins just about a half an hour from now at 7.30, so don't go too far. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.